terms of emerging opportunities beyond doing all of that well. <laughs> um, you know, and, and as part of that, there, I, I feel that there needs to be a much more intentional design process to a lot of this. It's all moving very quickly. And it's a bit ad hoc, and so that's one opportunity is to, to bring in some intentional design into, you know, how we knit together the services and um, the 160 staff and growing across all these 16 agencies intelligently over time so that we start to really collaborate effectively as quickly as possible. Um, the other emerging opportunity I'd like to highlight within that context is that um, effectively monetizing distributed energy resources, integrating that diverse asset base into planning uh, and operations is really a question of, of mathematics and data and political authority. We've known for a long time in the industry that uh, the reason why distributed energy resources are so challenging and often get talked about as though they're not cost effective is that we don't do the math right. Um, we don't have the access to all the data we need to do the math right. Um, the utilities do, but they don't really want to. It's a very fragmented landscape. And so if you actually account for all of the benefits that distributed resources create, they, it t tends to be 2x to 5x the cost effectiveness that the simplified spreadsheet models that a lot of the regulators use show. Uh, so these are you know, avoided costs on the grid side, the transmission grid and also the distribution grid um, for capacity and energy flows, how they operate, and also on the energy side and in terms of optimizing our portfolios, targeting and minimizing sources of electricity volatility and risk. Um, and direct market integration so they, they can, you can create virtual power plants and offset centralized grids, uh, centralized generation. Uh, so that, doing that well is really a big data challenge. And so it requires um, CCAs to really work together, put in place the right platforms, hire the right teams of experts, hire the right staff, data scientists, DR experts and start making the case at the legislature and the regulatory commission that we've been doing it, a lot of this wrong and we should open up access to data for CCAs so that we can actually prove the case and go forward with optimized planning. I'm happy to be here. Uh, I'm gonna go through a few slides. Uh, this is really about the theme from the, the morning session. So people like Jeff talking about the next step for CCAs, the emerging opportunities for CCAs and how CCAs and utilities as partners can do really what we want in the state and across the country, with an example being this North Bay Community Resilience Project that we're working with um, along with Sonoma Clean Power and PG&E. So I'll go through this as fast as I can. Um, I'm representing the Clean Coalition today, and this is really about advanced community and energy, these three things working together. We'll call it ACE for, for fun, right? <laughs> yeah, ACE. Um, Clean Coalition is a nonprofit. Um, we're in the mission here of accelerating the transition to renewable energy in a modern grid. Uh, we work in multiple areas to do that. So analysis and planning, grid modeling and optimization. So we worked with PG&E, for example, on the Hunters Point project to prove if you take a bunch of renewable energy and throw it at the grid in the right way, optimal, targeted, you can get a lot more on the grid and you can get a lot more performance out of that in terms of cost effectiveness and sustainability. We do program and policy design, and then we encapsulate all this into what we call community microgrid projects. But if you're a CCA, don't let the word microgrid throw you. What it really means is the community and the assets in that community working together with the grid and the utility in the best way for cost savings, again, for clean energy or resilience. So think of it as community DER, if you will. So a community DER, community microgrid, is different than a traditional microgrid, which focuses on a single customer. We're talking about community scale. We're talking about looking at the energy assets in a community across generation, across load shapes and load use, uh, across energy storage, and across how the actual grid operates to make the most out of that for communities. 
Um, it's modern, it's more cost effective. It is an emerging opportunity because it's fairly new. We have a couple of or, 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 or community microgrid projects we're doing as proof of concepts, if you will, but they're gaining steam. So you're targeting an area, you're doing the most cost effective um, DER for that area based on loads, based on the generation opportunity. Um, you're adding resilience. So it's ongoing renewables based, or renewables based backup power serving critical and priority loads in case the grid goes down. And you know, resilience doesn't exist really, right, in a centralized model for the grid. It really comes with a distributed model that we're working towards. And then it's a replicable model. So this can be applied to any community area, substation area. Um, I like to think about this in terms of local balancing. So we're talking about the transmission grid and the distribution grid really being equal partners in how we manage electricity, how we save costs, how we add clean energy. That doesn't exist today. We have behind the meter, we don't have a whole lot of wholesale distributed generation part of a mix that allows that local balancing to happen. So we're flattening and lowering load shapes across entire community areas, reducing the system peaks. We get to these time of use rates where the evening ramp is gonna be really expensive. How do you do that if you're exporting your renewable energy off your distribution grid and then importing off of transmission during that evening peak? That's the most expensive way to do it. So we wanna manage variability and volatility locally. And then again, provide that energy resilience and security that would not exist otherwise. So that's how we have equal partners coming. And CCAs have a role in this because you're the representatives of the communities and the value that communities have inherently in the fact that you've got energy assets there and ways to shape loads and ways to generate locally. Um, so this brings up a, a project that we're working on with Sonoma Clean Power, who are leading, of course, uh, Jeff talked about this, the Advanced Energy Rebuild Program that Sonoma Clean Power is leading to bring, bring back homes to get them rebuilt in the most energy efficient way with all electrification and with being interoperating with the grid. We're also working with um, PG&E on the grid side of this to bring uh, a lot more resilience, to modernize the grid with local resilience, local segmentation, local automation, so that our, our community grids can really serve us the way they should, uh, including more cost effectiveness. Um, it includes uh, um, building codes that are being advanced, and Jeff talked about that this morning, um, and establishing a blueprint here, again, so that it can be replicated, so we can have resilient communities, cleaner communities, and lower cost electricity for everyone, which is something the CCAs have, have pioneered in terms of clean energy, and now it's the next step. What's emerging for CCAs? Pioneer the whole <coughs> system being lower cost for your customers. This is the, a long list of team members on this project is to show that it does take a team. It takes people across both the grid side and the community side to advance this solution, to advance our community energy. And again, this is where um, CCA 1.0 moves to CCA 2.0 and 3.0 as Sam mentioned, and becomes the representative for all aspects of a community energy system and how to, how to advance that. Um, so here's, here's my point. <laughs> the future of energy is distributed in that balanced way, right? Look at this. California in March, California did their 2017-2018 transmission plan. They approved 17 new transmission projects, etc. But look what they did. They canceled 20 and 21 were revised and the savings is 2.6 billion dollars to california ratepayers that's enormously important for all of us we can't continue to throw money at a transmission focus system we need to balance transmission and distribution again that local balancing saves us all money we should be looking at things like distributed solar and storage again instead of peaker plants instead of more transmission how do we pair those things together and make it work for all of us Another example is Vermont, they're paying certain customers to have storage be controlled and used by the utility, again, to achieve that local balancing to lower peaks. If you look at the, you know, the transmission access charges, which are an issue here in California as well, look at how they increased in Vermont. Um, and so they're really trying to figure out how local solar, local storage can reduce these big costs on all of us. Um, ComEd in Illinois, they had an eLab accelerator recently and it really, it featured the local utility. And essentially this is about utilities changing their role, right? They're evolving. And this is something that CCAs have to take into account as CCAs want to continue to, to differentiate and provide value. So uh, in this accelerator, the utility is saying we need to now advance to 
power sector decarbonization, 100% renewables, community development and equity, beneficial electrification of other sectors like, you know, like EVs, transportation. And also, um, they are looking at sharing utility and customer microgrids, right? So again, they're looking at the distribution grid becoming this very, very well engineered and operated system that provides that local balancing and benefits customers with resilience and lower cost, less energy coming off transmission, right? That's what th this utility is doing. So I'm painting that picture because <laughs> if you look at the explosion in transmission investment, it's gone way, way up. Even in California, where apparently our loads have stayed, stayed pretty static, uh, our transmission costs are increasing. We have an actual transmission charge on the end use of electricity that we have. It's not based on whether that energy is on transmission and not on distribution. It's, it's every, we all pay for this even if energy is only on distribution. So that's got to change. Um, DER is what changes this. We all know that DER has all these values. I'm not going to go through this list, but it's a lot of stuff. So the idea is you take DER, <laughs> I have to call this the DER Wheel of Fortune. We created this slide about four years ago when we worked with PG&E on the Hunters Point project to show that if you take optimal feeder locations and you look at connected feeders within a substation, you can share energy across those connected feeders at different times. Um, you look at the local load shapes, of course, and you optimize that whole portfolio to avoid all kinds of investments in grid upgrades, transmission and distribution, and then you use your rate design to actually um, to, to carry that forward. So that if we need to use more, obviously more electricity during the day, during the solar surplus, we can, we can do that, shape that way, and we can also store that electricity or some of it for using in the evening ramp. Um, but DER plays that role of, of lowering that cost and giving us that optimization with this kind of look at the data, which everyone, we know we need the data, Utilities have the data, we need access to it, we need companies to get access to it, and then we can shape things in this way. Um, local balancing, I mentioned, so this is lowering customer costs, increasing local investments, that's very important for communities. <coughs> Improving grid performance, we talked about, it's delivering resilience and security, and it creates a replicable and scalable model. And the advancement of utilities on the side of this is really, we think, becoming distribution system operators, so DSOs who are operating the grid to support all this, but they need partners. They need the CCAs to actually represent the community aspect of it. All the people and connections that CCAs have can advance this whole model and actually drive utilities towards this role. Now, you, you CCAs did the great thing of driving all of us towards more clean energy at a lower cost. Now, what's the next thing you want to drive towards? What's that mission that Jeff talked about this morning? That mission, to me, is helping change how the utilities operate and how they're compensated so CCAs can be very successful, successful in this new advanced community energy world. Um, Hawaii just passed legislation saying that utilities will no longer be compensated for capital infrastructure. Huge change in the utility business model. I think that's the big next step here, and I think CCAs can help advance that. And finally, where are CCAs on, on this whole picture? So, where are you on lowering costs for customers via this sort of community DSO optimal DER, lowering costs, adding resilience, adding security? Um, your customers benefit from these non-wire solutions versus more transmission infrastructure versus aggregated peaks. Are we looking at aggregated peaks as, a, as an industry? How do you differentiate long term if you're not doing these community beneficial things? Um, it also helps support, of course, electrifying transportation and, and the next step in homes and buildings, which is all electrification and appliances, as was talked about this morning, heat pumps, uh, water heaters, and others that interoperate with the grid. So become partners with your utility and advance these programs, which is happening in Sonoma Clean Power, for example. It requires this complete service uh, territory analysis across loads, across peaks, across all costs of transmission, and defining those optimal portfolios and reaching out and getting those as part of the system. And it requires reforming uh, the existing transmission access charge. You gotta get that charge off of distributed energy only because that's adding a tax to that distributed energy. I'm wrapping up. Um, we got it, we gotta change that. So there's a, a bill in place, um, SB 692, to change that. I, I ask all of you to support that. Um, and it requires that the concept of regionalization, which we know is good, actually uh, keeps us with uh, full support of local balancing and control. We can't give up that control of local balancing. We can't allow federally subsidized coal, which is what they're trying to do, to lower the cost of that coal 
lower than solar and then require that coal to come over to California from Wyoming or Nevada, right? We have to be careful about that. Um, and, um, and it requires, again, I think, finally driving and supporting this new utility compensation model, which I think is a big next step. And that's all I got. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, SMUD, as she said, is uh, the lo local utility serving about 600,000 customers here. And we are helping uh, Valley Clean Energy with a broad range of services. One is data management, so doing their billing service, uh, handling all of their phone calls, um, so data management and call center. We're also doing their energy procurements for them through our wholesale energy services. Um, services. And then we are also providing them uh, staff support for finance, um, customer uh, programs, and um, and key account management. Uh, so we also provided them uh, launch services, uh, doing their initial rate analysis, their financial modeling that took into account what are the various portfolios that they could have, uh, what kind of rate structure could they afford, what would that look like for development of reserves and risk scenarios um, with varying PCIA assumptions, PG&E rate increase assumptions, market prices, things like that. So we've really taken the full-fledged approach to providing a comprehensive suite of services. Um, and this is something that I think we have 70 years of experience running a uh, vertically integrated utility. We own our own generation um, with a large hydro system being a key component of that that helps keep our rates down. Um, in addition, we do our own power procurements. We run our own meter to cash process. That We have our own meters, we have our own meter read system. Smart meter deployment was one of the early smart meter deployments. Um, taking that in uh, creating uh, bills, creating our own rates. So really owning the end to end, end process. So one thing that we saw as an opportunity was when our neighbor in YOLO said they wanted to launch a CCA, um, we were in talks with them to say, you know, we've done a lot of these things. We've never been a CCA, but we've done a lot of the pieces of this. We'd love to help you. And it's been fascinating for me as a part of that to see a lot of it is the same, but a lot of it is slightly different. And we think there are opportunities for CCAs to continue to grow. Um, so we helped launch VCA. They, they launched uh, June 1st, so pretty recently. Um, and then we're also helping uh, with East Bay just on the data management and call center services. Um, one of the things that has been interesting to me is that a lot of the CCAs are starting off with really a matching program of we're going to match PG&E's rates with a discount. We're going to match PG&E's um, power portfolio, but you know, make it a little bit better. But there's a lot of this sense of baselining to what PG&E already does. And I think that's definitely a great place to start. It makes the marketing easier to say your rates are going to be the same except for 2% you know, discount, whatever the case may be. Um, but I think what's interesting is for SMUD, you know, we compare our system average over time to PG&E, but when we set our rate structures, we set it independently. When we set our programs, we set them independently. Um, and I think that the CCAs have great opportunities to start to take their rates, make the rate structures their own. Say, how does your rate actually affect your marginal cost? What are the actual marginal cost studies? Are there some customers who are being overcharged or undercharged? Because when PG&E sets their rates, they set it for a system-wide kind of average profile. And that might not be representative of your community. Same thing if you're doing a peak day pricing program, any kind of critical peak pricing program. Those are set by PG&E. You know, they pick the event days that are based off of the temperature, you know, kind of at an average basis where that impacts their load. But one huge benefit of CCAs, aside from just the cost and the green, is you know, how do you actually tailor those programs to what you need in your community? Um, one thing that we've seen at SMUD is we have our own portfolio of energy efficiency programs. Um, so as was mentioned earlier, we have also the heat pump water heater. Right, but we can have conversations with the community about what makes sense for us. Um, one thing that really is near and dear to SMUD's heart and to our board members' hearts is our uh, shade tree program. So that's something that if you're interested just in the cost of energy efficiency, that might not be the most cost effective way, but because of our community values and what we believe in, that's something that we value strongly. And so that's a great opportunity to say, how can CCAs find out what is important to your community? And I think you know, I've been impressed. Um, you know, SMUD has a locally elected board, but it's an independent board. And so we have to interface with all the different cities and municipalities, and we have kind of an area that does that. CCAs are even more tightly integrated with oftentimes the board members being the board members of the cities and counties. So there are great ways to streamline the permitting and application processes, um, especially if you want to move into things like distributed energy resources. So there are some challenges, though, I think, that CCAs face. Um, you know, a lot of times there can be lack of scale. Um, and that's something that I think SMUD can help with. We have a lot of experience that we can draw on to support you in that. Another one is that, especially with DERs, while it makes sense at the end of the day to have a DER and it's economic, a lot of those benefits don't accrue to the CCAs. They accrue to the investor-owned utility. And so, and as was stated, you might not have the data uh, that you need to figure out where's the best place and the best way to both deploy and dispatch those DERs. So that's something that SMUD has a lot of experience in, that we've seen it from the utility side. 
We can say this is how we do the analysis for ourselves when we're citing DERs. We can also say this is the data that you might want to look at from PG&E, and this is how we could make the case for what is the value to the T&D side for PG&E or SoCal Edison or whatever your uh, local utility may be um, to make the case for why there should be some sharing of the benefit. So SMUD is definitely interested in helping, providing these services. We have a lot of other programs too. Um, some things that we have is we launched recently a SMUD energy store, a website where people can uh, buy various energy efficiency devices and get the rebate processes right through that website. Um, some of these things are even things that SMUD already has a program set up. We already have administration in place. It might be as simple as saying, how do we tag that on, do some branding, and then all of a sudden you have that up and running without any real administrative costs uh, overhead of your own. So we're really interested in saying, how do we further local governance, uh, local control, renewable energy, and how do we support the public power business model? Thank you. Yep. I think you're, yeah. <laughs> I think you really have a few minutes to our speaker I and am. to the audience for their Q&A. I have a pleasure now of introducing Michael Mark from Recurrent and just to take a pause for a moment, both SMUD and Recurrent Energy are generous sponsors of this entire event. I want to thank them for both their leadership and their support. Thanks, Margaret. Uh, so I uh, run development, project development for Recurrent Energy, and uh, we are uh, the foremost developer when it comes to working with CCAs. We've got 300 megawatts of projects contracted with various CCAs in California, and about 130 megawatts with SMUD, actually, across five projects. And uh, as we look at you know, what's important from a developer's perspective in emerging opportunities, I think we see the growth, of C the growth of CCAs as a huge opportunity for not only utility scale development, which is our focus, we, we would agree that there's a balance uh, with procuring utility scale, sort of low cost energy with local DERs, even though DERs are not our business. And I think one of the keys for us as we work with different CCAs is to work sort of early in the process with the CCA on credit. If we can't get a, sort of a, a strong view on credit, it's hard to get financing for uh, the PPAs, and that just results in a higher PPA price. So uh, one of the things that um, our advice to CCAs would be is to try to get a credit rating and talk to credit rating agencies early and often. And I know that uh, one CCA in particular has gotten a credit rating recently, uh, which I think will help uh, sort of pave the path to get credit ratings in place. And uh, I think one other emerging opportunity uh, in California in general and with CCAs is uh, the inclusion of storage in utility scale projects. All the projects that we develop uh, have a storage component. And as we see, uh, you know, as available solar becoming less valuable, uh, the addition of storage to those projects makes them more valuable and uh, makes that product just a lot more dynamic. Uh, in the market. Uh, and I think one other thing um, that we think about with respect to uh, just working together, again, go back to integrating DERs and utility scale projects. And I think the combination of those two products, you know, very, very low cost utility scale energy uh, that, you know, is built maybe somewhat remote to the end user, but still within the same state is uh, extremely important. And I th when we think about utilities, uh, we work with utilities a lot. Uh, they are one of our main customers in California. I'd say now that's moving more towards CCAs. But if we think about the importance of utilities uh, for grid stability, we view that as critical. I think there's, there's gonna be a restructuring in how these markets work, but I don't think it does anyone any good uh, for utilities to become insolvent. I think we need those utilities there to manage the grid and figure out ways to be partners uh, with utilities sort of collectively between developers, uh, CCAs and the utilities themselves. So look forward to fielding questions. Awesome. Um, one of the things that Greg said was, here's this interesting DER model that effectively reduces costs for so many, but it also strikes me as being perhaps an existential threat to the utilities whose patch is we need to figure out how to compensate the IOUs appropriately so that they remain solvent. How would you address, I'm gonna sort of like th throw this out to all of the panelists, how would you address that sort of inherent <coughs> tension between we really do want to save our ratepayers money, we really do think there are different, more effective ways of operating a distribution system, and the utilities need to be compensated for this, how, how would you each resolve that tension to ensure that our IOU partners remain solvent. 
<laughs> you, you being a utility. You, can start off. you want me to start? Yeah. yeah. All right, I, th I think we are at a point in history and, and Hawaii has taken the first step as the bellwether really for this, which is it makes no sense to compensate utilities anymore based on a centralized model of generating and distributing electricity because we now have all this technology and DER and capability um, on the distribute in the distributed side. So it's just like, you know, people talk about the telecom industry being an analogy, which is when mobile came along, it changed the entire industry. And, it's the, and we can't lose the utilities. I 100% agree. I'm, I'm in full support. We, we work with pg and &E all the time, and I'm in full support of the distribution grid being fully operated and managed and automated and all those things that we know it can do with the utilities in the, utilities in the role of doing that and being compensated for that in a way that allows DER to be fully valued at scale and broadly. So it's the, it's the compensation mechanism for utilities that needs to change. It might have to happen at the regulatory level. I don't know, probably. But I think there's a lot of people um, within utilities who would agree with that. And I think we're at a point where we can make that an initiative and move that forward. And that is what will accomplish that. And I, I'm not going to go through details there, but I think the conversation should happen. I just add one thing. You, <laughs> since you said we're a utility, I mean, SMUD is a utility, but we're not, as a publicly owned utility, yeah, we right. set our own rates. So we're not actually uh, compensated on the basis of capital. Yeah. So I think compensation on the basis of capital drives lots of adverse um, yeah. incentives, right? So it's basically the more you spend, the more you make. And I think that's something that um, definitely needs to be tackled. You know, but it's difficult to say, how can we identify what are the outcome metrics? Rather than paying people for spending money, how do we pay for reliability? How do we pay for services? Um, I think that's probably the right direction to go, but I think there's a lot of uh, nuance and difficulty in, in measuring what are, what are the metrics that we measure, um, because you can't compare one IOU service territory to another and just say, if you hit the same SADI score, yeah. you know, then, then we'll pay you the same amount. Um, so I think there's a lot of complication in that, but I think as we get more data and more analytics, there will be ways to, um, to do more evaluation of that and try to transition to a different cost model. Any other comments? You want to risk on that? No, go ahead. Okay, so speaking as a former uh, distributed energy consultant specializing in utility of the future business models for a multinational consultancy, um, before I started helping CCAs. <laughs> uh, how to put this? Again, there's no real problem. It's, it's more how do we do the math and how do we manage the politics? Because for the current investors of utilities, you could actually maximize their returns by maximizing the utilization of the networks that they've built, right, and that they've constructed. Um, the utility itself may not continue to grow its rate base ad infinitum, right, and take on new investors. But for the current investors, they should be fine if we design this transitional uh, regulated business model well. And so that's not, the discussion over reforming utility business models tends to be very, you know, high level, right, very, got to do it. We've got to go to performance-based incentives and how we're going to fight them over it. And Well, actually, there's a way to intelligently do this so a lot of people win and kind of all the main factions, the utilities are, they have factions within them. Um, and so that conversation, I think when, I, when you asked the question, I thought about the, the commission's green book and their so-called customer choice initiative, which is scratching the surface of it, but really approaching this from kind of the wrong angle in many ways. And so I think CCAs can play a role in evolving that discussion so it's actually uh, gets us to where we need to go as quickly as possible. So uh, coming from the utility scale side of the business, uh, no specific suggestions, but I think uh, open and direct collaboration between the CCAs uh, and the utilities is absolutely critical as in most businesses. And I, you know, I think we can get there. So, so follow, another question, and some of this is going to touch on data, which I know has been a topic of conversation when we uh, spoke earlier in planning this. Uh, one of you referred to the current situation of energy data as a hot mess. And, and I think 
many of you feel that pain, whether you're working on a climate action plan or something else. But there's also the issue of if we are leading, if we are leaning into opportunities of the future, as an organization, any CCA, even you know, even MCE is a new, is a young organization. And so without perfect experience and without perfect knowledge and without complete knowledge and with a hot mess data issue, how do CCAs lean into the opportunity of innovation and understand and internalize what it means to take a risk not having perfect data, not having perfect information, and not having a long history of experience? Knowing that there, there are going to be mistakes and at this stage of the game, that may have outside consequences. Okay. Uh, well, so I think that hot mess comment came from me. Uh, <laughs> I've received and analyzed data across all three investor owned utilities for CCAs, and the tariffs aren't standard, the quality of the data isn't standard. Um, and then once we launch, we don't get equal access to operational data and the business processes all, are all different. So I think, you know, that's kind of just developed, that was set in place 15 years ago. It's been tweaked a few times, but we really need to revisit this holistically and say, okay, how do we standardize access to data across all the investor and utility territories and really broaden it because it's, we get a very small slice of data. It's very designed around uh, an anticipation of a wholesale-centric community choice agency. So that's the first thing. It's not that the data quality is bad, although there are, you know, with big data sets, there are all issues, but over the last decade, you know, there's a very large non-energy focused industry that's gotten very good at cleaning and managing large data sets and deriving business intelligence analytics from them that we can leverage and bring right in, almost off the shelf with a bit of customization. Uh, so I'm, I'm not concerned about data quality or how we use it, how we figure out how to use it. There's plenty of analytics um, and we can actually manage risk uh, through performance-based contracting in various ways, if we're trying to do something really innovative and we're relying on the private sector to do it, well, instead of just paying them a fee, regardless of if it works, there's all sorts of ways that we can align their performance incentives. Like if it works, then you get a, you know, a piece of the revenue you generate from your activity, and if it doesn't, well, you know, then you're lying to us. So, uh, anyway. I'll just support all that and quickly add that um, coming from 15 years working in internet software startups where data was the core of these you know, businesses, um, I came over to this industry and, and got a chance to work with PG&E and with companies like Integral Analytics. And the data's there. Um, smart meters give us all the data we need and the utilities also have a lot of data on how the grid operates and there are lots of companies um, some nonprofit and some for-profit who are accessing this data, have access to it, can get access to it. What we need is the demand. <laughs> the demand side is where this needs to evolve and communities and CCAs who represent those communities need to pull together as a aggregated, organized, aligned entity to say we, we demand this data and we demand to use this data in these ways. And it wouldn't cost that much. I mean, this is inexpensive. Data and software is really not, <laughs> no longer this new expensive thing. And it's just like, I mean, this is the, you know, being in Northern California too, it's like we have so much expertise in, in this. So all I'm saying is, is it's available and it's out there. We just need to coalesce it, demand it and drive it. I think as far as the risk aspect of using data, there are definitely low, low risk ways to enter the data market, shall we say. Um, so, one thing that we've done at SMUD is taking load shapes, load profiles, and identifying, you know, what are the load profiles that are going to benefit the most from, say, a demand response program or from some kind of distributed energy resource? And then to say, how do we actually look at then the customer demographic information that we can get, you know, from either purchase records, from city county records about, you know, building size, building characteristics, to say, how is it that we would target this customer and how would we give a message? I think historically, you know, utilities have done a lot of messaging that just says, here's our new program, it's open for everybody, whoever wants to join, join. Or we might segment it and say, okay, well, it'll be for commercial, not residential, right? But if we can use data to say, who are the best recipients of this program, who's going to benefit the most, and how would we actually message to those customers in a way that makes sense to them, then that's 
not really a risky way of using your data. Um, same thing if you're looking at your rates. Right now, if you have a 2% rate discount, right, on average, and if you look at the marginal cost and say, actually, what would be more aligned with the marginal cost is if we gave a 3% rate discount on, you know, let's say the off-peak, and a 1% rate discount on the on-peak, well, net, you're the same. And yeah, you do have a little bit of volumetric risk, but assuming your marginal cost study was, you know, relatively accurate, you should actually be in a better place. So I think there are ways that you can use the data to tweak your policies you can definitely experiment. You can start on smaller rates. You can start you know, in smaller areas or with subsets of customers. So I think if you're not looking at the data, that's, that's a bigger risk than any risk that you would take by looking at the data. Uh, nothing for me on that. Okay. I'd love to open it up to the audience. Because this room is a little bit muffled, if you have a quiet voice, please come to the microphone and ask your question. If you have a loud voice, please stand, introduce yourself, and speak your questions standing up so that the rest of the room can hear. If you're speaking from the front, in particular, people in the back can't hear you. So questions for our panelists or each other. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let me sort of throw it out here because you know we're like before lunch, it's low blood sugar. How many of you are in a CCA? You have a staff role in a CCA or an emerging CCA? Okay, about a third, quarter to a third of how many of you are in communities that are just looking at it and you are trying to figure out where you should go, if you should go CCA? Okay, a couple of you, excellent, thank you. How many of you are consultants that serve CCAs, whether it's a you know, financial advisory role, technical advisory role, policy advisory role? A, a few, and then there's the rest who may be, <laughs> shout out, academic, student, yay, academic, thank you, anybody else? Developer, awesome. Energy provider, Energy provider awesome. And local government, awesome. Anthropologist, therapist. <laughs> Trader. Trader. Okay. So, so there's there's a broad ecosystem, as as Jeff just mentioned, as this is evolving. There are risks and challenges emerging. There are interesting opportunities emerging. And there's also the politics that are emerging. And one of the things that keeps occurring to me is. What goes up must come down. The last time we had an economic downturn, it impacted local governments a little bit behind how it impacted for-profit organizations, but the impact is profound and long-lived and hard to climb out of. Not if, but when there is another economic downturn. How will it affect CCAs? How will it affect your organizations? And I would challenge maybe some of the audience members to chime in. How would that affect your pursuit of a CCA or your engagement with a CCA? And how should CCAs prepare for the inevitable? Yeah, so having done some financial modeling uh, for some CCAs, I think it really depends on what the nature of the downturn is and also on the specific exposures that the CCA has. Um, so definitely if availability of credit uh, could be constrained in an economic downturn. Um, so that, that really depends though on if you actually need credit for what you're doing. A lot of CCAs have you know, already entered into the credit arrangements that they need. Um, some have longer credit history, as you mentioned, some have a credit rating, uh, so that can help you. Um, but part of it is what happens to energy costs overall, too. You know, energy costs may come down as well when it comes down. So some of this comes down to what's your hedging strategy? How far forward do you buy? Um, what level of reserves do you buy? This is something that, you know, we've advised for CCA starting up. Say so you want to first get on a little bit of a buffer of cash, and you want to make sure that you're hedged, you know, a little bit forward, but not too far forward, because you also have the challenge of PG&E also is hedged forward. Um, so depending on your relative hedge to PG&E, you could have unexpected impacts. Um, hedging forward doesn't just guarantee price stability. You need price stability, but if those prices end up being high relative to PG&E, then that price stability isn't worth much. Um, so I think it's, it's interesting, and there are a lot of challenges, and it's going to depend on the specific community, but to say, how can you be aware of what are the risks that you're taking? Um, I think it's important for um, utilities to provide some level of stability to people and local governments. Um, you know, it's a great opportunity to try to be countercyclical to say how can we actually inject money into the economy at times when it's low. So if we have a reserve and we have a backlog of projects that we want to do, how can we time those projects to do them when times are tough, not when times are easy? But there is obviously a political challenge to um, both saving the money when times are good and sometimes suspending the money when times are bad, which is unfortunate as that's kind of reverse of what you really want to do economically. 
I was, I was just, you know, thinking about that question in terms of communities um, in economic downturns, you know, people end up losing jobs or not having as much money to pay for rent or pay, pay for utility bills, right? And, um, you know, energy, electricity is now such a critical resource for all of us. We, we run everything off of it and we're going to be running more off of it in terms of transportation and home appliances. So it becomes more and more critical as a resource for communities. So in an economic downturn, we have to protect prices. Um, we can't have electricity prices that, you know, electricity is running our communities. We can't have those prices varying based on, you know, worldwide market issues. It doesn't make sense. And so we can protect our communities against economic downturns by having more community energy systems that have 20, 25 year consistent pricing that's lower than what it would cost us to pull energy off of long distances and in transmission. So that's one aspect of that. So I go back to credit and uh, keep CCAs keeping their financial house in order. Uh, I think Michael made a good point. If you've got some dry powder and the, the economy ticks down, you're in a position to buy probably at a very low price because the development cycle and utility scale projects is five years. And those projects need to go to market at a certain point. So if there's only a few uh, CCAs around that have built up some cash reserves and still want to act on PPAs, they're probably going to get a better deal than if they had bought at the peak of the market. It's just like the housing market. So I think uh, that is critical and just being mindful of uh, financeability of these projects. resource availability and grid stability aren't things that we're particularly concerned about uh, going forward. Uh, it's more about cost and managing uh, unexpected shifts in fundamentals and prices and the resulting customer opt-outs. Um, I could talk more structurally about that, but I'm not very, that wouldn't really further respond to your question. Well, you know, I, I, I'm asking you, I, I don't really have the answer to it. So if cost is the answer, then that's good to need to know. So, I mean, just generally, there are, there are RECs available in the market, so you can buy the renewable attributes. I think long term, though, CCAs want to be building new renewable resources. So in the short term, you, if you have a large load, and uh, LA is presumably going to have a relatively large load, right? you're not going to be able on day one to just buy all new all brand new renewable steel on the ground resources for LA, but you can buy the renewable attributes. And the question is how much will that drive up the price of renewable attributes as many CCAs are going after the same renewable attributes and who else wants to buy them? Now, a nice benefit of that, of driving up the price is that it's going to put pressure and that's going to make it more attractive for people who are actually building new resources. But some of you could probably speak better to, to that. Yeah, I think uh, as we look at the ability to put steel in the ground, uh, as I said before, that's a you know five-year cycle, and uh, I think if we if we just look at sort of where I think CCAs are headed, I agree that they want to put iron in the ground. They don't want to just continue to buy or buy racks. They want to create new projects and say, I'm taking energy from this project in this location. So uh, I think. Costs continue to come down. You know, we see solar costs continue to drop precipitously. I think storage costs are going to come down, uh, and I think storage makes renewables much more uh, dispatchable. 
And I think we're facing a future, you know, starting probably in 2021 in California, where we don't see any new solar projects getting built that don't have a storage component. So I think that's that's where the market's headed. Storage absolutely critical. Hi everyone, my name is Krishno and I'm from a company called Neighborly. We are an online platform that allows community members to invest in community projects. So this question is for you, Jay. Um, your community um, micro grid is very exciting stuff. But currently, how is it being financed and have you guys used bond financing to do such projects before? Yeah, that's a really good question because um, the financing for a community scale optimized energy system, community microgrid, can come from multiple sources um, and can come from green banks, from bonds, from um, companies who do their own financing to bring energy systems into communities and then they get paid back, of course, because that energy is being used every day. Uh, I don't think there's one answer or, or should there shouldn't, there shouldn't be one answer. There should be a variety of things. I do think, um, CCAs can do a lot more to partner with finance companies who will take on the burden of financing this without the CCA having to be, you know, cre credit worthy, although they all should be. <laughs> um, and there's a lot more that can be done there. I think it's a new growth area. I think you have time for one more question, and I saw your hand. Yeah, I'll, I'll start by saying the new project in the North Bay um, that Sonoma Clean Power is leading that Jeff Cyphers talked about is literally trying to answer that question, which is if we're going to build new homes, rebuild homes back in these uh, tragically fire destroyed areas, let's do them in a way that makes them efficient and zero carbon and also interoperate with the grid so that the grid is getting the most out of the fact that our homes and buildings can be advanced in that way and be valued for their efficient, not only their efficiency in, in reducing energy use, but their added efficiencies in using energy at the right time for when the grid needs that so that the operations of the grid is lower cost and, and more stable. So it's a big opportunity, emerging opportunity um, in pairing our use of electricity in homes, the efficiency uh, of that, and how that can become automated, <laughs> in a sense, with how the grid works. It's a, it's a big deal moving forward. So what about retrofitting Yeah, that, it, 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 sorry, yeah, that includes, it's not just new homes. It's, you're right, it's retrofitting. It's taking the gas, you know, hot water heater out of my home and putting in a heat pump water heater that can then be communicated with from grid operations and, and said, hey, use this pump, this, this hot water heater during the day when we got surplus solar because I need more energy use during the day. That's a, an exa just one example, but that's where all this is heading, yeah. So at a high level, uh, we're now getting to the point where we can uh, monitor the hourly load impact of efficiency measures of retrofits. And what that's going to, and it's still evolving, it's fairly complex, but uh, we now have open source standards developed around that and smart meter data analytics that are increasingly being piloted, proven, refined, and rolled out. Um, and so that's a complete game changer because the, the problem, everyone knows energy efficiency is the least cost resource, uh, but we've never actually been able to integrate it into grid planning or right because we've never had that sort of temporally and geographically specific impact uh, that's what we need and so we're about to get it uh, and that allows you to completely change the valuation methodology and unlock successive tranches of more cost effective energy efficiency now in terms of financing uh, there's plenty of money for cost effective investments of any kind uh, really what people what financiers care about is the repayment mechanism right and so 
the whole paradigm for efficiency has long been kind of a tax and spend where everyone gets a rider and then you make a big pot of money and you give rebates or whatever. Uh, but really, there's a huge opportunity to implement on-bill financing in California. Uh, we don't have that. Even though the utilities have on-bill financing tariffs and uh, it's, it's not actually on-bill financing, which is defined as you make an investment in some sort of DER and you recoup that investment through uh, monthly payments on the meter, regardless of the tenant. So you sell the house, payment stays with meter. New renter moves in, payment stays with meter. Uh, and you have to architect this carefully to, to, with consumer protections and equity. But um, if we do that, we've always known that we could drive another oh, one to $2 billion a year in efficiency finding, financing statewide every year if we have that secure repayment mechanism. That's why we don't have it, by the way. The utilities really don't want that to happen. They've killed it every time. Yes. And so with CCAs, again, getting back to the theme of we have the data, we can prove that we need new methodologies, more accurate methodologies. We can be the, the political driving force behind unlocking a better way forward. Great place to wrap up. I want to introduce Magda, who is our room steward and has been a volunteer for the event. And she has a couple of gifts to thank our speakers. And uh, while Magda is doing that, please join me in thanking all four of our great speakers.